Hey guys, how's it going? So I'm actually sitting here in Linate Airport waiting for a plane to Takamatsu, which is in the southern part of Japan where we'll be building a cool airship with a double hut and massive uh, greenhouse building. And I hope to be able to share some of those pictures with you guys um, on offgrid.vision. They'll be going up on earthship.com social media as well so check them out i'm going to try hopefully a couple of podcasts live which i've never actually done i've always done them by skype so i'm really looking forward to speaking with a couple of people out there uh I'm not going to name names yet but um, hopefully some interesting people who will uh be talking about various parts of the build and just have a, a conversation on site which i think will be really exciting and other news uh, is that this podcast is a special one. Uh, I always say that, but it sort of is. It's about a subject that's dear to my heart, refugees, the movement of people, migration in general. Uh, and certainly this one is focused in on the camps and conditions that people experience over long periods of time. These are not temporary situations. We're talking years and years and years so six years and counting and what does that mean for people living in what is a small town that's supposed to be a camp um, my first question off the bat with Lara was almost a little bit um, misplaced in that I was sort of referred to camps as what what the westerners often think of as beautiful little trips out with the kids and the fishing rods and all that stuff but this is a very different different situation and she's able to talk about these places, having visited them twice and studied them. Her work involves how they can be improved in the future, trying to learn some lessons we seem to be obtusely avoiding for some reason. And I was interested in how off-grid work could, or off-grid technologies and passive technologies could help with the situations out there. Um, it was the first conversation of its kind for me, and I hope to have more and educate myself more about what's going on and how off-grid stuff could help and not hinder, and as I mentioned in the podcast, not be a barber suggesting haircuts. So check it out, enjoy it, and um, I will be in touch probably relatively regularly over the next couple of weeks because I hope to release some smaller mini-podcasts with people. Um, if that doesn't happen, uh, bear with me, but it might, I hope. Uh, in the meantime, thanks for listening and see you soon. Thanks for, thanks for coming on and thanks for speaking to me. I know that uh, we've just met and spoken a little bit about what you do. I know much more perhaps about off-grid technology. You certainly know much more about conditions in in the refugee camps or settlements that you visited i suppose that's a good first question is we call them camps we call them settlements what is the the term you like to use well i use camps because it's the formal term that is used and understood by everyone ah. um so yeah i i prefer using camps it has a um a sound like a camping trip by a nice river cooking fish over the fire and stuff and i think that sometimes can be a bit misleading obviously well to be honest it depends on uh, where are you from <laughs> <laughs> so for us as middle eastern camps still like uh, we link them to the refugee camps well yeah. while if you're somewhere else from the world maybe you can link it to a more privileged situation <laughs> So you say here, I, I gather you're in the UK. Where, yes. ba whereabouts? I'm in Edinburgh. Um, I came to Edinburgh four years ago to do my um, master's. Um, and then directly I started my PhD afterwards. So here I am four years in Edinburgh. Great. And, it's, and the university is Napier, is that right? Yes, Edinburgh Napier University. Great. I'll link to... Um, the, the page and anything you know any research and stuff you have I can link it to on, on the show notes yeah thanks um, for that do you have an easy background to describe uh, when people say where are you from do you have an easy answer or are you someone who's moved around a lot 
Well, no, I think I have an easy answer. Um, I'm from Jordan, um, in the Middle East, if you don't know where Jordan is. Um, like, I was born there. I lived all my life there. I moved only to Edinburgh, uh, as I told you, four years ago to do my master's. Um, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so was it the first time that you traveled or not? Traveled for a long time, yes. Okay. And what's your impression? What are the things that strike you most about Edinburgh and the United Kingdom? Well, I love Edinburgh. Like, it's, I never thought that I would love Edinburgh the way I am. It's a second home for me. Um, I'm, I'm always willing to go back to Jordan as its home. But Edinburgh will always um, have a special place in my heart. Um, I never thought I would really consider it a second home, but I do. People are unbelievably nice it's a cozy city so yeah i'm so happy i had the chance to come and live here yeah it's it's beautiful yeah. what is the what is the stereotype if there is one of jordanian people compared to let's say lebanese or syrian or the other neighbors are there some stereotypes if you like or a, a national characteristic or well i love that people think we are generous well, honestly, like most Middle Eastern countries have this uh, yeah. maybe hospitable like feature, but I think Jordanians are known for that. Well, I think so. The generosity, certainly in the situation with what we're about to talk about today, is incredible. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. When was the first moment that you thought you could or would work with or for refugees? What was that seed moment where you thought, hmm, this is a possibility? Well, before working specifically with refugees, there was a moment that um, it was weird. It was weird that I'm mentioning it now. Um, it was when I was doing my undergrad. Mm -hmm. I remember watching a um, TV series that was talking about volunteer work. And I remember seeing um, a civil engineer uh, that was doing um, rehabilitation for um, some less privileged people um, houses. And I remember I felt so bad in that time because in my mind, in that time, I thought that architecture is for the privileged people. Um, but uh, so if I thought I was in the wrong place and it, 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 it kept it was in my mind. Um, and when I was um, when I decided to complete my studies, um, the like because I am from Jordan and of the long history of receiving refugees in Jordan, um, it, it was in my mind. And when I decided to do my PhD, that was my first option. I thought um, I could use my um, undergrad, which is in architecture engineering, my master's, which was in architecture technology and building performance. Um, so yeah, and I met, honestly, a very great team at Edinburgh Napier University. My director of studies is Professor Sean Smith and my second supervisor, John Bewood. So both of them were, were very uh, supportive towards the idea. Uh, so, yeah, they were very supportive. And, yeah, from there we started. Wow. So you were involved in architecture and then obviously you knew about refugee situations in general from for a long time and it was mm -hmm. at some point you said that you realized you could use architecture to do something useful was that what happened exactly yeah um i always wanted to serve a cause and i thought it was the right cause to start from yeah it's a cause that i feel emotionally connected to as well for no reason in my biography or my history but it strikes me that as humans, we've always traveled all over the world. We've all come out of Africa and spread everywhere. And to me, borders in general have always seemed a little bit absurd uh, in, a, in a strange way. I mean, if, if you had no borders and you suddenly said, right, I have an idea, let's make some lines in the ground, it would be a strange idea, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But yet, obviously, I can understand that different people have, you know, we've always been fighting for resources, et cetera, et cetera. But let's focus in on the situation in general. It's an emotional topic. Uh, I know in the UK, there's a real divide now with Brexit and all this kind of stuff. And here in Italy, it's a very hot topic. But the numbers that I've seen, and feel free to correct anything that I say, 
mm-hmm. that there are 68.5 million forcibly displaced people worldwide, of which 40 are internally displaced people, 25.4 million are refugees, and 3.1 are asylum seekers. And contrary to popular belief in uh, Europe and the States, 85% are in developing countries. So the top five hosts are, by numbers, are Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, Iran, and Ethiopia. But the top five by thousand population So looking relative to the local population, is Lebanon, Jordan, number two, Nauru, which is uh, a small island in the Pacific that not many people have heard about, that Australia have uh, forced a lot of people onto, Chad and Mm -hmm. Turkey. So I just think that those, that in itself is interesting. Is that something that you found surprises people or? Well, yeah, it does not surprise me. Um, but it does surprise people because um, they think they only hear about the people going abroad to UK or you know to other European countries, but they don't know that millions are going to neighboring countries to the to the um, source of conflict. And something else I would love to mention is that the numbers that are um, known are, or the numbers that we are talking about all the time or that the UNHCR are, have are the numbers that are recorded um, yeah. Yeah. as refugees in their own records. But the numbers are much more than that. Like, for example, for Jordan, the number is uh, around um, 668,000 refugees, um, Syrians, I mean. Um, and the numbers are around 1.3 million, the, the real number. But wow. only so half double, of them are registered double, yeah. as refugees. Wow. Well, speaking of numbers, the other thing in my notes, and I noticed, are that the top five countries are all uh, countries that have been, the top five, sorry, countries who Host? have to move, not hosts, sorry, the actual refugees themselves. Yeah, the sources. Of the them. sources are Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, and South Sudan, all countries that have been, had uh, Western military intervention. So that's something I often say to people when people start talking about why are they coming here. I say, well, you know, there's causes <laughs> and effects all over the place in the story. Yeah. So... Some more numbers, just very quickly, before we move on to more specifically where where you were. Another thing I like to quote to people is that Europe spent apparently about, it's, the numbers vary from what I've seen, but about $10.1 billion in the years 2015 and 2016 on refugees. And that's on, you know, the admin, the house, some housing, et cetera, et cetera, all of the costs. But they could be losing as much as 190 billion from corporate tax revenue due to multinationals using offshore loopholes, tax havens. So that's always a, a, a you know five percent essentially budget is spent on refugees compared to what is lost by mm. from tax. So that's another number I think is interesting just to uh, to mention. Last thing on numbers, I mean, are the numbers stable? Are they rising? Uh, are things getting better, worse? Well, unfortunately, it was because whenever I do a presentation or I do a talk, it all starts with some statistics. And um, I feel sad because when I started my PhD three years ago, I was referring to the number 65.6 million people who were displaced. Mm. And now we are 68.5. So the numbers are raising. But it's interesting as well to see the numbers of refugees compared to the numbers inside the camps. Well, in, like at least in Jordan, the numbers of refugees inside the camps is a bit decreasing, but not increasing. And the number, the total number are a bit increasing. But I know they're not receiving as much as they used to do when the war started. But it's interesting to see how the numbers change from time to time. So two camps in particular, I think we're going to focus on today, I guess. Mm-hmm. they Now, correct my pronunciation again. So Zahatri. Zahatri, yeah. Zahatri and Azraq. Azraq, yes. And just to say that each refugee has 
four options, don't they, when, when things happen? They can stay in a war zone, one. They can escape and to a camp, two. They can move to cities elsewhere, or which is a very difficult situation, or they can endure long, arduous journeys to another country, to Europe or to, to elsewhere. Is that fair to say that those are pretty much the options that people have? Well, yeah, as a as a first, maybe first response, yes. So we're going to talk about people that go to camps. We're going to talk about the camps and try and look at the architecture and 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 first of all the situation in the camps and then potential solutions if if there are some. So just a few more numbers, and then I want to let you speak about the, your impre- your place and impression and and how the, your story started with the camps. But initially, there are. 70,000 emergency tents given to families and then there were climatic extremes in the area of Jordan where you are aren't there so there's temperatures of over 40 degrees in summer but also heavy snowstorms potentially winter which is something that many people don't realize Mm -hmm. and then after the tents there were more solid shelters provided these five meter by 2.5 meter shelters and that, and these are the ones that were then moved around to create a sort of U, a more social positioning of the of the shelters. Is that right? Yeah, they they uh, replaced the tents with prefabricated shelters in Zatari. I'm talking. I'm not talking about Azraq. Azraq is a different uh, story. Um, if I want to talk about the difference between them both, Zatari was established as a response to the um, Syrians coming to Jordan after the war in 2012. But due to the increasing number of refugees coming to Jordan, um, Azraq was built, but as a purpose-built camp. So the shelters there were built, and then the refugees moved to the camp. While in Zatari, they they were coming to the camp, they were giving tents, and after some time, the, the tents were replaced with prefabricated shelters. So that's the main difference between the two camps. Uh, I guess we're talking about the shelters, so it's something that the list of, let's say, issues that I I read, um, I think both in your research and uh, another report that you linked to the AAHI publication, I'll list them and then maybe we can talk about them, but there's the air and dust and water ingress from the gaps between the walls and the roof, the fact they had wood floors that got damp. Rats could sometimes access the buildings, ventilation from covering the windows and blocking the the ventilation holes to avoid dust. That's the the, the issues with these shelters, or or maybe you can talk me through this rather than me regurgitating your research back at you. <laughs> well, <clears throat> yes, there are some. There are some of the issues. The issues are much more than that. Right. Um, if we want to talk about the. The shelters, again, Zatari shelters are different than Azraq camp shelters. Um, but both of them, the walls were not sealed well. They, The residents put fabric on top of the roof to try to seal the gaps in Zatari because they had flat roofs. But in Azraq, because it's a patched roof, the UNCR provided them with a, um, an internal lining. But... Uh, they removed that lining after some time because they thought, according to the to the refugees, and maybe I have to mention now that I went to the camps twice, mm. both of them, to Zatari and to Azraq. I went the first time to do um, some um, focus group discussions and observatory tours with the refugees. And the second time I did uh, participatory design sessions with the refugees, and um, maybe I can talk later about um, the two visits. Yeah. But um, in the first visit, the refugees told me that uh, in Azraq they removed this lining and put them as um, external de- um, dividers to enclose some space, some private uh, outdoor space for, for the families. The temperature inside is unbearable in Azraq specifically and in Zatari, but in Azraq because it's a, a warmer area. So that's um, in terms of um, the walls and roofs. The windows in both camps, well, the Azraq camp window is smaller than the Zatari one. But in both camps, I found something very interesting, Patrick, that they were uh, covering those windows. 
And even though it's, as I said before, the, the temperature is unbearable. And apparently because they overlook public areas and the privacy for them is prioritized over the ventilation. Yeah. So they were covering those windows from inside or from outside. Um, yeah, to protect their own privacy. On, under, on, like, on the other hand, the policies in that area is different than the policies in Azraq. Well, because uh, of what I said about how they established both of them, that area camp, they were, they were allowed to do changes on their shelters. So they, whenever they could afford buying prefabricated shelters or uh, sorry, um, corrugated uh, sheets mm -hmm. or fabrics, they were enclosing more spaces and adding spaces to their own shelter. While in Azraq, they're not allowed to do any changes on their own shelters. So that difference made the, the Azraq camp residents a bit restricted on what they can have. Sorry, so it was Azraq that they could change or they couldn't change, sorry. In Azraq, they couldn't. They couldn't, okay, right. Yeah. So in that area, when they added those spaces, they could open some windows or, you know, they, they could design or redesign their shelter to have a bit more ventilation sources. But in Azraq, the situation was really uh, tough and it was them. So take me through what happened. How did you get permission to go? What was your process? The first time I was helped by uh, Save the Children in Jordan. Well, they have, uh, I have to take a permission from the government as well, but I was accompanied by Save the Children um, in Jordan to the camps. The second time I was accompanied in other camp with Plan International organization. And in that day, I was again accompanied by Save the Children. So, um, yeah, both of them helped me a lot. And um, I met the residents in their own offices, let's say. Mm -hmm. So you walked into the gates because they're closed compounds, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So you went inside the gates and what were you feeling? Were you, were you excited, nervous, worried? To be honest, before I, uh, I accessed the camps, I was a bit worried. I was afraid that I would do anything that is um, um, unaccepted to them or that I will... Like, I was very conscious of what I say and do, let's say. Um, and I was I was afraid that I would be emotionally affected, and I did not want this to to appear. Um, but when I entered the council, when I talked to the refugees, there are two things that I found, uh, or are the feelings that I felt. Mm. The first one is that I got power from them. I felt they were uh, they empowered me actually, because. When you see those people talking about their struggles with a smile, and actually because I recorded our uh, conversations, uh, when I heard them when I came back here, I was thinking like we had good laughs actually. And yeah, even yeah, though yeah, they were yeah. talking, yeah, even though they were talking about their struggles and things that are really not the nicest things that happen to them or um, how they live or the routine of their days, but because they were laughing at them in a way, just of course, because they can't do anything else. But yeah, they, they empowered me from that side. From another side, I felt responsible that um, I have to deliver what I get to the board, let's say, through papers or uh, presentations. And I, tr I tried really to remember cause them, some stories that were personal maybe to them and they shared them with me. Um, and even though I assured them many times that I'm there to get their help or um, to do my research and I'm not going to, I, I have no um, no power to give them any thing they want, but they made me feel that I am responsible in a way. I know that, that may may sound weird, but yes, that's how I felt. Well, you, you are in contact with this outside world that, has, that is essentially out of, out of grasp. You've come in from a world which is that they can't touch. I mean, you're the only exactly. contact with the outside world. Yes, maybe. Like, I'm, I'm sure they talk to loads of people. But maybe like, their stories, the stories that they shared with me, they did not share with others. 
or maybe they saw something in me. I'm not sure. I remember an incident that happened well in my second visit. Mm. Um, I was talking to um, a man and he said, well, if you have any contact with people in government, and I I directly said, I have no control or I have no contact with anyone. He said, I, I told him I only have my own voice. He said, it's more than enough. And he felt so touched. And I wow. keep remembering this. Yeah. Um, I felt so responsible, honestly. Um, yeah, I hope I can really do something. I'm not sure I can where I'm standing now, but at least this is a goal for me. Well, so your, let's say your strategy is to write about the, con- yeah, tell me what your strategy, you're writing about the conditions, you're comparing the camps. What, what is your your next, what do your next five, ten years look like if this is if this is a sort of mission for you, I guess, now? I'm really looking forward to um, finish my PhD as a as a first step, and hopefully um, soon. Um, after doing that, I'm really hoping to affect the, let's say, the strategy that the NGOs go through. Because one of the major findings from my research was that there is, and I totally appreciate what the NGOs and UNCR yeah, 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 yeah. do, but I found that there is something wrong. Of course, like all what we are seeing that the the camps are still struggling the same exact issues that the camps 70 years ago used to face. Amazing. That is shocking, honestly. And I can easily relate between the Palestinian camps in Jordan with the Syrian camps in Jordan. And I feel sorry when I feel that they're going through the same the same process and the Palestinian camps now they're more like slums, and I don't want to see the Syrian camps in the same situation that the Palestinian camps are now. So I really hope that um, the criteria that I'm suggesting in my research, in my PhD, would be considered. And one of the findings as well in my research is how we have to consult and uh, coordinate with the users the users of the shelters, of course, they have to participate in designing those shelters. And that's what I did in my second visit to the camps. It's just a small thing that you can do. I designed a tool and they gave them a um, toolkit to design their own shelters. They, they were more than happy by feeling that their uh, opinion is valued, even if I assured them again that it's only an experiment um, I'm not presenting the UNCR or any organization, but they felt so happy being able to design their own shelters through that tool. Um, the participatory design concept is um, used lately a lot, but the issue always is to be able to design a tool <clears throat> that can allow the unprofessional people who has no design background. So, so the, you mentioned a tool. What, what kind of tool are you talking about? I give them a very simple toolkit that has cardboards, a blue tech, you know, just uh, small materials. Uh-huh. And I asked them, we had um, a conversation before of what they're lacking in their own shelters, what they're hoping, what the main functions they have in their own shelters. And then I gave, uh, I divided them into groups and I did four sessions in the two camps. And I I asked every group to design their own preferred shelter. So they just started using the materials I gave them to do rooms, you know, courtyards, um, even sometimes a a water fountain. You know, just the things that they really hope to have. And of course, I know they're not designers. Those are not final designs to take forward. But what I did afterwards is that I turned those models, 3D models, into um, 2D plans and I started analyzing and compare, comparing them and I went out of that experiment with some standards, uh, things that they really need, that they all gathered and it was really, let's say, shocking to me that I found that the men had different approach than the women in some issues. And that was really shocking, yeah. And um, actually, that 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 gives us an indication that when we consult the the users, we have to consult everyone. So I did those sessions with children in school, with women, and with men. And 
it's amazing to see how they have different needs, even though they have things in common. So, yeah, can you give it some examples, maybe? The courtyard. The courtyard is one of the major things that I found. But, um, to be honest, from my first visit, from the first, let's say, days of my research, I found out that the outdoor private area is very important to the, let's say, the newcomers uh, to Jordan, the Syrians, uh, because back in their home, they used to have the space. And in the camps, they're spending more time in it. When I did the participatory design sessions, I found out that the women valued the space more than men because uh, apparently they spend more time in it while men have more freedom of movement um, inside the camp. Mm -hmm. uh, the women spend more time inside their own shelters. So they valued more the outdoor space, even though they both inserted them in their own designs. But the women made it larger, made it, you know, it was their priority. And I will quote one of the participants uh, saying, she said, it's more important to us than the whole shelter. So that's how important is this space to them. But men inserted the space, but they cared more about the um, family setting room uh, oh. to have like larger family setting rooms. So that was one of the differences and a lot more, but yeah. So this thing that you're talking about with the NGOs and obviously often the intention is very well-meaning, mm -hmm. but in practice, uh, I studied, I mean, I studied just to give you a little bit of background as well. I studied at IDPM in Manchester and this was in 2003, I think, and everyone was talking about participation and speaking to stakeholders, and it just seems to be an ongoing theme that is never resolved properly. So it sounds like some things never change when it comes to that. But I could also imagine that there's a, an emergency. There's I don't know how many thousands of people coming even every day into this camp. I know the, the the numbers were incredible. We hear a lot about the the numbers and we've spoken about numbers, but a few things, I just wanted to put a bit of context and then go back to speaking about the houses. So there's a lot of cultural aspects, aren't there, of the way people live. There's also things like the the amount of time that people spend there means that there's going to be weddings, there's going to be relationships, there's going to be organization and governments, governance, there's going to be uh, different types of governance. We're reading about the official governance, then uh, religious leaders, then more organized crime. In general, crime seems like it's a, a very important aspect of life in the camp, safety, security, movement at night, all of these all of these aspects come together within the house and the design of the camp, don't they? Yes, of course, yeah. What are the, some of the things that struck you or the surprises you heard about, or either good or bad, in terms of all of these living elements? Well, um, again, the numbers, as you said, are unbelievable. Um, uh, maybe I have to mention the numbers in both camps so people have like an idea. In Zatari, um, now they ha there are around 78 or 79,000 um, residents. And in Azdok, there are around 41,000 residents. So we're talking about huge numbers that are living in, let's say, not a small area, but um, remote area. Yeah, you can see it on Google Maps, can't you? I looked at it and it's quite... You know, if you look at the satellite view on Google Maps, you can see the camps. Yeah, specifically Azraq. Zatari uh, is close to um, um, a town called Zatari, uh, a Jordanian town called Zatari. But Azraq is really remote. There are around two years between my two visits to the camps. And thankfully, I found a difference between the first visit and the second visit to Azraq. The first visit was really very touching in terms of the location and the context they are staying in. It was literally a desert. I was touched by uh, by that. So yeah, that that living these living problems, you know, the, the some of the crime, some of the the cultural aspects that aren't being listened to, the fact that people 
may have been leaders of their communities at home and then they have to move and suddenly maybe there's new power struggles. Is this stuff you talk about with people or is it maybe more of a sociology area that that's not your main interest? Well, some of them came into, I was not looking after the, those stories, but they came into the conversations. Um, for example, you were saying, especially because the, the toilets and the kitchen in the beginning were communal in both camps, um, after some time, um, the Zatari people, they built their own shelter, their own uh, toilets and kitchens. In Azraq, they're still using the communal toilets. They're not using the communal showers because they think there is no privacy nor uh, like security in using them. So they're showering inside their own shelters. And that, of course, brings a lot of respiratory problems to their kids and to themselves. Um, that is one thing. And there's something that uh, really I always uh, keep remembering, a story that I heard um, or like a conversation I had. Um, a woman was telling me that they always come and tell, uh, talk to us about early marriages. Well, when you have uh, kids in one room and, you know, the shelters are only one, like, box let's say it's not even um a house so uh, when you have the kids with their parents living in one room you can imagine how the girls they just want the, fir the first opportunity to go outside uh, those For shelters sure. so and at the same time i heard a story from one of the girls uh, she was so excited that someone proposed to her and she was only 16 years old and was shocked about that. And she was excited that she wants to get married. And her only excitement, or her excitement came from only one reason, which was uh, that her uh, future husband lives outside the camp, so he would take her outside the camp. And I felt so bad, honestly. I felt um, that, yeah, people come uh, and start talking about the early marriages and stuff but they have to know the reasons behind this and yeah. solve those issues. Like what you can't, like all the, the people I interviewed and I talked to in the two visits, they had one major issue, is that how come you put adults from both genders with their parents in one room to live their life? They shower, they cook, they eat, they, eat, they sleep, they study, everything in one room. Can you imagine, Patrick? This is... Yeah. unacceptable not only in and uh, let's say um, a muslim country it's in, it's in all countries oh, no, it's I'd, unbelievable. I'd go nuts i'd go nuts yeah so uh, like i heard i wish i can share all the individual stories i heard or the, the issues about men crying in front of their own shelters just because they're spending time outside because their daughters are showering inside for example and is it is it possible that whenever someone wants to shower to force the, the rest of the family outside of the shelter. Mm. You know, it's, uh, there's small things that... Um, but it's daily things, isn't it? It's repetitive, exactly. it's unknown in terms of the scope and the time. It's, it's just wearing, isn't it? Exactly. All of them were very thankful that they had the opportunity to live in peace, um, and they were appreciating Jordan and the HCR efforts. But at the same time, it's a long, it's a life. Like, uh, the Azatari as camp started, established in 2012, and we're now in 2018. So you're talking about um, six years? It's a whole life. Like, people who were born in the camp are now in school. So they know nothing but the camp. Well, it's a formative years for someone who's 12 to, to 18, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, yeah. incredible. Let, exactly. Let's move on to the, some p potential solutions. And let me, let me throw some questions at you in terms of off-grid solutions and how they may or may not have potential in such an environment and conditions. As I mentioned in the email, the last thing I want to do with this initial exploration of these ideas is to be a hairdresser that thinks everyone needs a haircut. So the first area of off-grid, or let's th let me give you a bit of background. I'm very interested in, in earthships, which are a type of building that have 
six main principles. They are autonomous. They uh, are off grid. So they're not connected to electricity or to sewage or to water or to anything. They're just completely autonomous. You can put them in a field and nothing, no tubes or wires go in or out. And the six principles of these houses. So water collection first principle, sewage treatment second principle, plants in the house, so food third principle. The houses are made with re reusing materials like tires from cars, used tires and bottles, which are covered with adobe mud. Uh, so you don't see them. There's no, they're very beautiful houses. You don't see the tires, but they create these earthquake resistant, very solid thermic mass walls that retain heat and also cool the room to create a consistent temperature of, let's say, even in in New Mexico, where they're first designed by Michael Reynolds, the architect, they've managed to, in a place where they have over 40 degrees in the summer and minus 30 in the winter, create rooms with passive heating, so thermic mass and cooling, which maintain an indoor temperature of between 22 and 24 degrees. That's using the thermic mass of the tires. They also generate their own electricity through solar and wind power. So having listened to your descriptions of these camps, I know there's a major issue, and that's that often they don't want any permanent structures to be built, not even trees to be planted, which was I found shocking. But let's forget that limit for a second and look at some of the basic needs we're talking about, water, showering, etc., I mean, just water collection or sewage treatment and composting to create soil, which could then be used in permaculture gardens, which would give people access to good nutrients. And more than anything, the dignity of building shelters or building on growing vegetables and being busy creating sustenance for free in a circular way. That's the short story. What is your reaction to that in terms of the possibilities it might offer or the feasibility? Well, again, like I'm not so knowledgeable about the off-grid construction or earth yeah. but I really love their ideas. Like I, I read some stuff about them and I really like their ideas. I have maybe two main concerns regarding the, the whole concept of uh, off-grid construction. I think in terms of, let's say, Thanks to uh, consider more. I think it's very feasible in long term duration, but I think it will be costly for the for a short term. And we always look at the shelters as temporary shelters, even though they stay for much longer time. Yeah. So this thing is to consider, and something else is the time. Usually after a disaster, we have uh, this rapid need to give um, a solution. But I really think that the principles of the off-grid construction or the earth ships shall be involved within the, the shelters for emergencies. Um, and I think they started doing that in terms of electricity. Azrak now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Azrak Camp um, is running by solar um, solar panels. So... Um, I think it's really useful. I think if they use the water, for example, the treating water and uh, reusing them, I think in the earth ships they be used the water four times, yeah. um, something like that. So I think it's very useful because Jordan is, uh, I think, the second poorest country in the world in terms of water. So um, it will be very useful. And other, of course, other uh, principles um, like the sewage system and thermal mass walls. The thermal mass walls, it depends on the materials. Again, um, as I said, or as you said, permanent materials are not allowed uh, in camps. Most governments around the world, they don't um, accept permanent materials. Maybe uh, if, if they can use more into the after natural disasters, where generally, not every time, but um, there are less complications with um, natural disasters than conflicts because in natural disasters the land is not always an issue the status of the land like usually they rebuild their, the shelters 
on their own land. Um, even though the most vulnerable, they don't have uh, legal documentation over the land. So one question. So I, I, I realize that that's a very real problem. Uh, and the idea, my, my general thinking about this would not be to create loads of permanent shelters straight away, for example, because mm-hmm. that's a problem. But if you break down the principles and you look at the, let's say, something like designing a construction that would be semi-permanent, which is a ridiculous term, but uh, let's say a temporary structure that could collect water, could be perhaps a compost toilet, so it would be creating soil and resolving the sanitation problems, and then combining that with perhaps even a biodigester, for instance, which is a very easy to make container that has bacteria in it, which produce methane when they process organic matter, so waste food. And you just throw the waste food into the the container, it produces methane in continuity, so you get cooking gas and a fertilizer and soil all for free in con- continuity. Uh, that's one example of a technology that could provide free resources also the idea of permaculture and growing vegetables where even if people were to leave they would be leaving you know a garden a vegetable garden in the desert Uh, i just find that so inspiring i love the idea of people looking into camps and seeing abundance somehow now this is the beginning of my exploration into this i can imagine there's all sorts of issues i have i'm not aware of but that's exactly why i was excited to speak to you but do you think there could be any individual aspects of these technologies that could be applied or or not definitely yeah definitely i think it would be amazing using those principles um i think the resources or having the the principles of of grid into camps make them empowered more make the residents especially that they would uh, do things by themselves yeah. in, in in a lot of those uh, principles and this is again what i was uh, looking at is that how to make people involved as much as possible in in, in designing and in uh, maintaining their own uh, shelters and something uh, else is that the fund is cut in a in a specific time they can't the ngos can't fund the camps forever so um, with those principles they would depend less on fund and more on themselves and uh, their their daily efforts to to take care of those principles so i think yeah it would be an amazing um, research to do and apply maybe because one of one idea the way i think is i'm all i get excited about scalability and to organize training on a well thought out prototype that was resolving real problems with a good budget to train people to do that obviously as you mentioned it would provide them with the dignity and the sense of worth of of looking after themselves which is priceless but it could also be something whereby people are trained as natural builders if you like and can then help local people do the same because i'm convinced that architecture went almost on pause if you like for 50 years it feels like certainly in england it's on pause for the last 100 years and we're not using these technologies and permaculture and low water usage um, for for growing crops for instance in places like jordan which is dry um, and does have a big temperature differences. I mean, you mentioned snowstorms in winter. So these houses in thermic mass, regardless of the refugee camps, which have the issues of permanence, could also be used in Jordan itself. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 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 I think like, especially in, in areas where we have um, um, extreme weather conditions, there are some areas in Jordan that they have um, always very hot uh, weather. So I think it would be it would be very useful for, as he said, even for the hosting community, not only for the for the refugees. 
yeah, my dream is for people just to be able to be self-sufficient and not rely on, you know, the institutions and even governments that uh, don't always have our best interests in mind. But you mentioned snowstorms as well, or you mentioned it was written, I've seen it in a number of places, that it can get yeah. cold as well. Is that true? It's true, yeah. Like, um, unfortunately, in 2013, I think, after the, the refugees were settled in Zatari camp, um, a very hard snowstorm came and it destroyed a lot of the tents. And that was, I think, the the beginning of thinking to replace the tents with uh, prefabricated shelters. It was very tough on them. So, yeah, like there, we have very tough winters and we have tough summers. Sometimes not, of course, we have like um, maybe a month of extreme weather in winter and a month of extreme weather in summer, but still they're unbearable. Wow, I imagine. So the, these these houses actually do work in my, in minus 30 and plus 40 which is phenomenal at no cost no pollution and they can be made by people um, very easily we're talking about maybe three weeks to build a house for that could house 14 people uh, we did one yeah, amazing, in nepal yeah. with tires so if you hear of anyone who might be open to that kind of project then don't hesitate to get in touch with me yeah definitely I may take the course. I saw the, they run some courses. So I was like, oh, maybe by my, by after my PhD, I would consider going and taking a course. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they, they, Earth have just got a new partner now. Uh, I think it's Colorado State University. I'm getting the name wrong. Apologies. But they, they're now working together with the Masters of Sustainable Design to be more practical and to provide this practical knowledge. Yeah, that's amazing. There's uh, there's academies every year. The next one is in Japan, which will be in November. So if anyone's interested in that, they can go to the Earthship site and get involved. Great. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to ask you just a couple more questions. Yeah, feel free. If you had $100 million to solve some problems in the areas you've been to, what would your approach be? Hmm. <laughs> well... I think I'll start from the policies from like to be able to serve as many as possible. Mm -hmm. And for for even the future, I would go from um, I'll start from designing a core unit for every region, because I believe that even though there's no one shelter fits all solution and that's a, a default for me, I think if, if we can design a core shelter for every region um, that share the same culture, maybe the same weather conditions, then when a disaster happens, we can add on that core shelter and um, adapt it uh, to the situation. But the problem with the shelter response in emergencies, I think, is that we always start from zero. And I don't know why we're in 2018, we're still doing that. Yeah. Um, why we don't pre-plan? Why don't we have something, like disasters do happen. Like I'm not hoping them to happen, but they do happen, whether natural disasters or man-made, like conflicts and wars. So if we just pre-plan a core unit for every region that could be used, adapted, uh, added to, but we shall be ready. We shall have something to start from instead of starting from zero every time. I think it will save a lot of lives. Wow. That's something I think about a lot as well is with these academies and off-grid building techniques is getting the information out to people in a scalable way where people can take matters in their own hands. And frustratingly, the real problem is not building and creating the structures. It's being allowed to do it. That's the real limit, whether it's here in Italy, you know, in Europe in general. And for me, as, a, as someone who's thought about development stuff for a while from an academic perspective and seen some, some of the realities in NGOs in Geneva, for instance, I feel great about trying to, or showing or suggesting these solutions to people because they're solutions I would want for myself. So it's something that is a little bit different, but uh, there's a long way to go in terms of scalability, that's for sure. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, Lara, thank you so much for your time. Thanks to you. <laughs> it's been great to speak and you must uh, send any links you want me to include uh, that I can include in the show notes. If you had uh, an ask or a request of any listeners, now's the time. If you have anything you can think of that you'd like people to do, things you'd like them to read, uh, actions you'd like them to take, shoot. <laughs> well, um, yeah, thanks to you for giving me this opportunity and I'll definitely give you uh, indeed the links I want you to include. Well, something for the people, I think maybe to read more. There is a bit of ignorance towards the refugee issues. And it's not only fund that those people want. I think they need people to feel with them. The refugees are not people uh, who are taking from your own from your own you know um, yeah they're not sorry. trying to steal something they're not trying to take yeah they're not they're not trying to yeah if that is the term i'm trying to find the <laughs> the most <laughs> soft terms but yes i think there is misconceptions about refugees uh, any one of us can be at any time a refugee unfortunately that's true and what happened with syrians really touched me because if you hear the story, you feel that those people were living their normal lives and one day, suddenly, without any notice, they found themselves in this place uh, looking for another country to host them. So, and when they, when, they, when they arrived to a certain country, usually they pass through a lot of pain throughout the journey. And when they arrive, they feel that their life will restart. But what most cases say is that their under pain starts uh, because, wow. yeah, because they struggle to adapt. They struggle to be um, involved with a new culture, with, uh, you know, like it's a new life. And when they go to a country that they don't speak their language, it's even doubled or tripled. So if we all do our part just by welcoming them, um, whenever we find them, just by helping them, not by money. I'm not talking about fund or you know donations. I'm talking about um, making them feel home and empowering them. If if we can offer them jobs, let us do. If we can um, offer them even a smile, it would mean a lot to them more than you can think. So it just to remove them the misconceptions about refugees and read about them and read about their stories and look at them as individuals not as numbers yeah. i think we would react differently if we do that to see them to see them and to acknowledge and connect even briefly makes such a difference doesn't it definitely yeah definitely yeah well listen thank you so much Thanks to you. And I hope we stay in touch if there's anything at some point along the line that I can do for you. Do be in touch, but take care. Yeah, yeah. you too. Please keep in touch. And uh, I think what you're doing regarding the Afghan construction and earthships is really interesting. Um, I started reading some stuff, as I told you, after you, um, uh -huh. uh, you emailed me. And I'm still, like, obviously interested in knowing more, so... Best of luck in whatever you're doing, and let me know if I can help in anything. Great. Um, and thank you. <laughs> okay, see you later. See ya, bye. bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Before you go, or rather immediately after you've gone, please go down to iTunes, leave a review, help us grow, get more guests, raise more money for projects. We have other projects coming up can find news about those on offgrid.vision where you can also get access to other shows and some phenomenal t-shirts which go towards well the profit of which goes towards new projects if you have any requests for someone to come on the show do let me know via the site until next time thanks for listening and see you soon